morning. My name is Glenn Duncan. I'm going to talk to you a little bit, if I can, about Moore's Law and how it's changed, basically, technology over the, over the years since it was thought of, and even before then. Just that not name to it yet. All right, before I tell you about the theory, though, I need to tell you a little bit about the man who came up with the theory. His name was Gordon Moore. He was born in 1929 in San Francisco, and he started his studies at Berkeley in California. And then after that, he went to California, California Institute of Technology, also called Caltech, and graduated there with his PhD in chemistry and his minor in physics in 1954. And then in 1968, him and Robert Noyce got together and created Noyce Moore Electronics. Does anyone know what Noyce Moore Electronics soon became? I believe. Uh, he was then the vice president of Intel up until 1975 when Noyce, or when Robert Noyce, who was the president, stepped down for some reason. And in 1979, he became the chairman of the board. And in 1987, like 1979, he was the CEO. In 1987, he became chairman of the board. And in 1997, he became the chairman emeritus. And then the theory, the term Moore's Law was actually coined by Carter Mead, who was a professor at Caltech where... Uh, Gordon Moore had studied. It's based on a quote from Gordon Moore in 1965 that was published in an electronics magazine titled, Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits. And the quote that was mainly used to make this theory was, the complexity for minimum component costs has increased at a rate of roughly a factor or of two per year. Certainly over the short term, this rate can be expected to continue, if not to increase. Over the longer term, the rate of increase is a bit more uncertain, although there is no reason to believe it will not remain nearly constant for at least 10 years. This means that by 1975, the, computer, the number of components per integrated circuit for minimum cost will be 65,000. I believe that such a large circuit can be built on a single wafer. And then this is the, uh, sort of shows the timeline of how many, uh, and how, how many transistors were on each circuit. And I don't, I don't think you guys can see it, but down here are some pretty old things that I really haven't heard of. And then up here we have like our, uh, up at the top, sort of toward the top, we have like our atom processors, our AMD, uh, hey, I can't even. Now, All right, and then he altered his statement in 1975, and he altered the projection to a doubling every two years. And then there have been some parallel theories to come about, and uh, some changes on our electronics as we know them today because of the theory, such as one thing that uh, happened was manufacturers began to sort of, instead of using Moore's Law, you know, just having it off to the side, they sort of used it as a goal. They were like, okay, well, if he says this, then we're going to try for it. We're going to, if everyone accepts this, then let's go beyond that. And so some things we saw uh, changes in were the, uh, the, ratio of capacity of a hard drive to the cost of the actual hard drive. And I have a hard drive down here if you'd like to pass it around. Also one thing that uh, was parallel to that theory was the power consumption of basically computer systems. Today we have systems that take relatively little power. Like, uh, for instance, I have one up there, that, over there, that we're going to talk about here in a minute. 
and we all know like how the lithium ion batteries now give us the ability to have uh, increased portability and uh, increased battery life and usage of things. So like standby time, I was looking recently, standby time for the new MacBook Pros is like 30 days. Depending on if you just leave it sitting or whatever, it could power it could power on for 30 days. I thought that was just insane. But. And then pixels per dollar as well. Here I have an ad from uh, it was 1950. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's see. It's a 12 and a half inch black and white television for only 169.95. And that's in uh, the currency back then. We still use U.S. dollars, but their U.S. dollars, what was $169, today would have cost $1,655.64. And then today we can just go to Walmart for five cents more and get something 24 inch with HD quality. Just goes to show how not only the price has scaled, but how the quality and the technology and everything up. And then there are some distinct advantages to the fact that everything is getting smaller. There are some distinct advantages, such as lower cost, such as that television I just showed you. Uh, you could go and get that television for like $169. Today you can get a really good TV. A 24 inch might be a little too small for some of y'all's taste, but heck, that would be good for me. But uh, there's lower cost and also increased productivity. Not only do we have these computers that now, now we have more ways to make our machines more productive, such as the first laptops, they had integrated, uh, or first notebook PCs rather, they had integrated displays, but there wasn't really a way to double the displays. Uh, if you, well, uh, yeah, could you pass around my uh, Toshi real quick? One thing I would do with my Toshiba satellite when I was at the house uh, is I would have the screen, the integrated screen running with whatever I was wanting to do, and then I would have either, depending on what mood I was in, I might want the game on the integrated screen. And Facebook on the uh, external monitor I have, and so depending on what I wanted to do, and then maybe I also would be doing a Word document or uh, research and I would need to pull stuff to different places, I would just pull it like that. So it increases your productivity, and also now today we have increased performance because we're able to fit more transistors onto a single processor. Uh, if you could uh, well, when you get a chance, pass around that motherboard. You let me borrow. We did some quick research, uh, and this motherboard processor on it is a two gigahertz processor. That might not seem like a lot to some people, but back in the day, if you'd said two gigahertz, they'd been like, "Well, what do you mean gigahertz?" Like. Uh, We'll get to the specific calculations later, but the ENIAC, I know y'all have heard of, y'all all heard of the ENIAC probably. It did nothing like that. But performance has increased a whole lot over the years with not only having, being able to fit more transistors on a single chip, but then being able to fit multiple die or cores into a single processor. And then also the portability. You can take you can take it around, you can take these machines around with you almost anywhere. Uh, that however can be both an advantage and a disadvantage depending on what machine you're talking about, where you're going, and if you're prone to dropping things. And also the availability of it. Uh, if you could pass around my little cell phone. Uh, my phone had been broken for a while, and so I decided I needed a new one. Uh, and I picked that phone up for around 90 bucks on eBay. I thought that was a pretty swell deal, and I still do at times. 
But we'll get into why that could be an issue in a minute. And then disadvantages. It seems that with most machines today, the disadvantages are very similar to the advantages of the same machine, such as the fact that it's portable, makes it more complex and tiny to work on. That, uh, like today, especially with Apple's machines, Apple's uh, iDevices, if you if you have it, uh, they're very they're difficult to work on. Not only because if anyone other than an Apple certified technician touches it, then your warranty is voided, but also because everything on there is crammed so tiny, and that only they really know how to fix it. It's easier today to repair or replace it, and things are uh, more f likely to fail these days. Well, I say that, but the ENIAC, it had multiple fail to the time to boot it, but like in modern computers, more modern computers like in the uh, 1980s and stuff, uh, you wouldn't really have, okay, some examples. I had my old uh, HP TC4400, it's sort of a tablet PC if you have the stylus, but I never did. I had it sitting on the couch, and then I got it up and I didn't realize that my leg was about to knock it off the couch. And my leg knocked it off the couch, picked it up, it was fine, it was still running, but it was running slower, so I shut it down and then I went back to it later and the hard drive was completely destroyed. The hard drive was destroyed because when I knocked it and I jolted it, the, uh, the head crashed. And so I was unable to recover that data and I ended up having to wait for a new hard drive. And also just random sporadic failure. Uh, if you could pass around a little flat, one of the SD cards, the P, I think it was the PM1 or something. Flash memory today is very widely used uh, in applications such as holding uh, pictures for cameras and other uses as well. And I'll get into one of those uses here in a minute. But, uh, I realize I'm saying uh, so much, I'm really sorry about that. So flash memory, it is very useful in the fact that you can fit like what used to take entire hard drives. Now you can fit on a single small chip, a single small uh, device that you just plug into your computer, you plug into your camera, you plug into your phone or whatever it is. And, but one thing about that is, once a flash memory module goes out, there's not much you can do for it. Like, there's really almost next time nothing you can do for it. My aunt has had so many uh, camera cards, and she'd have them in the camera, and then they'd go bad, and then she'd go, well, what do we do now? There was nothing we could do. We couldn't get the pictures off, and we couldn't repair it, because it was so dang tiny. Like, I mean, these days you can't repair a lot of things because of how small they are, and also a lot of things are pressurized, such as the hard drives we have today. So if you, even if you were to open it up, you'd probably make it less reparable than it already was. And then also with generics, my cell phone that was just passed around. Uh, with the availability of being able to create more uh, types of devices, like Everyone, there are lots of different manufacturers that can make an Android cell phone because the software is open source and you can, they can basically just mix and match it to their specific needs for that specific model of the phone. Yeah, that's good for like Samsung with their Galaxy phones, but how many small companies like Cubot, who I bought my phone from, are going to go through the effort, I don't think it's working, are going to go through the effort of actually doing that. I've noticed some uh, compatibility issues with my phone, like I plugged it up a few times I could use the USB storage function, but after that, like I, could, I still can't use the USB storage function. If I, if I want to move something to my phone, I either have to use Dropbox or take out the SD card, put it into one of my SD card adapters then plug it to the computer and put something on it. 
that can be a hassle for some people. But that is, that's one of the things about it is that people ask me, oh, what kind of phone do you have? It's like, I really don't know what to tell you. Even if I tell you, you've never heard of it. It's a Cubot C9W. Not that that means anything to you, me, or anybody else, and it has a really small amount of RAM. It doesn't have a whole lot of RAM in it, and the processor's not very good. So you guys have probably, well, I'd say all of you have heard of, if not played, the game called Flappy Bird. Well, you, the concept of the game is you tap the screen and you make the bird flap up. And it goes pretty fast. Not on my phone. I've got a pretty good cheek for that. My phone goes slow that it doesn't go up to speed of what uh, all the other phones make it go. So y'all are up there tap, 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 and I'm just tap, tap, tap. Has its disadvantages and its advantages. But they are very fragile. The whole reason I needed a new phone was because I had dropped my prior phone onto the floor at the Sonic I work at. Oh yeah, falls to the floor, breaks the floor. Nokia 3310 is notorious for being indestructible, which I've actually seen some videos where uh, they would tie like little firecrackers to it, and uh, they would.